Good afternoon, welcome to HRTV. My name's Toby Simpson, and I am honored to be sitting next to Professor Peter Capelli, who is the director, who's the professor for education and management, as well as the director for HR for the Wharton School. Professor, welcome to HRTV. Thank you. Now, I understand from my brief research that uh, you're not just a bigwig in the world of academia, but your journey is taking you you know, outside academia into business, even into, into government. Could you tell us a bit about your journey and, and how you've got to here? Yeah, I guess I would say I'm a little wig, not a, <laughs> not a big wig, but uh, I was interested in this uh, in graduate school. So um, my PhD is in economics. I studied incomes policies at Oxford, actually, was my right. thesis. I spent about 10 years around Washington working first in the Reagan administration and the Labor Department and then in the Clinton and Bush administrations ran research centers on education and the workforce. And I think our contribution in those things was to think about how HR management practices affected the labor market and the skills in the economy in the labor forces in general. For example, do you train people or not as an employer? When you hire, what kinds of things do you hire for? Uh, all those kinds of decisions affect the quality in the, in the labor market and the economy as a whole. So I've been thinking about that intersection for quite a while. Actually, that's a very good point, and I wonder if there has been any research on it. In a modern fluid economy, in a modern fluid workplace, does it actually make sense to invest the money in training staff? Now, I think, for example, law firms, I think accountancy yeah. firms that have enormous training programs, yeah. and a good chunk of those staff then go off and leave. Or does it make sense simply to use headhunters, hire via whichever social platform people yeah. now hire, hire through? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and I think it is a, a fundamental challenge the U.S. has got right now and increasingly other countries. And that is many employers believe we shouldn't invest in our employees because we're just going to lose them. And the problem that's created is that everybody wants somebody who's already got five years experience and nobody wants to give them the initial experience. Now, if you look at company or places like law firms, and particularly accountancy firms and consulting firms, they lose a lot of their people. I think the big management consulting firms lose maybe 90% of their new hires in about five years, and they still train a lot. Why can they do it? It's the way they train, right? So the way they train is they learn by doing, learn by doing. It's the way you learn to be a carpenter and an electrician. You don't sit in a classroom for two years, you're in the field, Initially, you're doing very little skilled stuff, and eventually, pretty soon, they let you cut boards if you're a carpenter, and then they let you do the measuring, and then they let you start doing the framing. And each time, you're supervised by somebody, but you're learning by doing. And I think the problem for corporations is they don't train that way. They train by putting you in a classroom, and that's a really expensive way to train, and you don't get your money back until you've been there for six or seven years afterwards. The consultancy firms get their money back right away. They're paying you $100 an hour. They're billing your time at $300 an hour. So you're paying for it yourself as a young candidate because you're learning by doing. That makes perfect sense. Good. And, and sticking to the theme and a subject particularly close to my own heart as a, as a headhunter and having been within the recruitment industry for a number of decades, is uh, you wrote a fascinating book saying, Why Good People Don't Get Jobs. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit about that book? Yeah, the uh, start of that book was uh, during the Great Recession in the U.S., and maybe this was true around the world, there were a lot of news stories about employers complaining that they couldn't fill their jobs. And this was, we would call this a man bites dog story. It was so unusual that it got a lot of attention. If you looked into those situations, what you discover was that the employers had unrealistic expectations for what they wanted. They wanted somebody with five years experience, and they wanted them to have quite specific experiences with these machine tools, with these clients, with these customers already, and they didn't want to pay anything for it. So the reason they couldn't hire was because of their own practices with respect to hiring. And so that's what that book was about, was looking at the practices that employers were using to hire people. And a lot of this had to do these days with the fact that companies were getting enormous numbers of applicants and then the problem of trying to sort them out, right? And we do that in part through computers, software and applicant tracking software which screens the resumes and then kicks some out. So somebody wrote to me, I wrote something about this in the Wall Street Journal and I got 500 responses uh, to it 
people mainly complaining about their own companies. And one of the responses which made it into the book was somebody saying that they had gotten 25,000 applicants for an engineering position and not a single one made it through their applicant screening process because they had thrown so many hurdles into that job. 10 years experience, we need a master's degree, we need you to have worked in these fields already that nobody could pass through the whole set. So it was really a critique of the way we were hiring. No, I understand and there is that very frequently the, the plug and play mentality as we've talked about in companies not training but you understand why mm -hmm. people can now afford to be more you know sort of linear and prescriptive about the choices given that technology right. has allowed to have as such a broad you know range of choice in the job market right. versus actually training those skills themselves yeah so I understand the problem is you, you you've neatly pointed out already so what's the systematic solution what yeah. has to happen for us to get right. back to a position where we're in equilibrium with developing skills as well as hiring them. Yeah. So how do we think about changing uh, the system in order to make it work again? I think one of the things we need to do is think on the hiring side, uh, move away from the goal of just trying to get as many candidates to apply as possible. And the reason for that is we're not very good at sorting out candidates, partly because candidates aren't telling us the truth. They're telling us what they think we want to hear. So I think the goal is to get fewer people to apply, but to let them sort themselves out. So that if we tell them honestly what this job requires, and some of that is difficult for some people, we spend all this time trying to persuade everybody that we're the greatest place on the planet to work, but most jobs don't suit everybody. And so telling them, look, this job is gonna be hard because you gotta travel all the time. If you don't wanna travel, don't apply, right? This job is hard because uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and if you need a lot of structure, don't apply, you're not going to like it. So if we can get fewer people to apply, we don't have to be so incredibly picky with our applicant tracking system uh, and end up screening out people who might likely fit. I think on the training side, I think we've got to get better at work-based learning. That's where the gap is. Nobody's complaining we need more people with academic degrees. They say we need more people who've actually had experience doing something and training people in the means of learning by doing. In the workplace and corporations, for example, that means more stretch assignments. That means giving people projects to work on that are a little different than what they've done before. And one of the reasons for leaders to give them stretch assignments is this involves delegating. And so as a supervisor uh, dealing with your subordinates, you're freeing up more of your own time if you're delegating tasks for them to do. And once they get so they can do them well, you don't have to do those anymore, right? So we have to persuade organizations, but particularly individual managers, that developing their own staff is actually gonna work for them. Yeah, absolutely, the, the variety and the challenge that's actually gonna end up retaining more of your staff in, in the first place as well. Right. And right. I, I think as you mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation, workplace mobility isn't happening as much as it used to. Right. Individuals don't move around, let alone from outside the organization, from within those, inside those organizations. Right. They can be quite static beasts. Yeah. Why has that happened and, and you know, what is actually the situation and what can we do about it? Yeah. So in the US where you have some data on this, if you went back to the period of the great corporations before 1980 or so, when a company like AT&T had 75,000 people in their management development program, right? They used to fill only 10% of their vacancies from outside. And those were entry-level jobs where we were hiring people who didn't know anything yet and developing them. Companies now are filling about 65% of their vacancies from the outside. And if you're hiring from the outside for positions all the way up the organization chart, there's no opportunity to promote people from within. And now why are they hiring from the outside? Well, partly because they don't develop people internally, right? And some of it also is a view that, you know, people on the outside somehow know better. Now, I don't think anybody would suggest you go back to the days where everybody was promoted from within, because there are some reasons why you might want to get experience from outside in, but you might not need that much of it, especially if you're hiring people from the outside at senior levels. So I think if we could get better at developing people from within with stretch assignments, we don't need to go hiring on the outside. Hiring on the outside is quite expensive and it also drives turnover internally. Once I know that you know, I'm trying to fill your job because you're my boss, 
and your job becomes vacant and you hire somebody from the outside to fill it, I get the picture that the way to get ahead here is to move because I can't stay and get ahead inside. Absolutely. And not just that in terms of mobility within job positions, but organizations are going to have to cope with the fact that their workforce is going to get older and older and older, or, or it's going to be a much bigger range as uh, globally, um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, we're expected to live longer, mm. and therefore governments are changing our retirement ages. Right. You know, how good are we at, at, uh, at, you know, at blending an aged workforce at yeah. the moment? Yeah. Um, and what, you know, what needs to happen for that to get better? Right. Uh, well, you know, I think the first thing to, to note is the idea of having an older workforce is, is not new. You know, we've had retirement ages of 65 for a very long time. I think what's new is that in many big companies, anyway, we started to get rid of people around age 55 with buyouts and other sorts of incentives to encourage them to leave. And some of that, I think, was because of the belief that they were expensive. And I think some of that, uh, frankly, is not true. So I wrote a book about this a, a while ago called Managing the Older Workforce. And if you look at the data on older employees, here's the thing to remember. Experience is highly desirable, but experience is also correlated with age. Right? So if you said, I'm going to the hospital, give me the oldest doctor, people would think you're kind of nuts. But if you said, give me the most experienced doctor, they would say, well, of course. The thing is, if you say age, it sounds bad. If you say experience, it sounds good. But older individuals, because they're more experienced, have lower turnover, lower absenteeism, higher performance scores, better interpersonal skills. They're better on everything that we say we like. The problem is we discriminate against age. We think that older people are not tech savvy. We think that older people are stuck in their ways. Some of it is the case because Many older people are sometimes stuck in jobs that have bored them for a while. But it's not because they're older, it's because they've been stuck in the same job that bores them that's the problem. So we have to get away from discrimination against older workers. And if you're an employer, older individuals have exactly what you think they should need. Now I think one of the challenges is younger supervisors are increasingly having to supervise older subordinates. And they find that difficult, frankly because they say, geez, how could I supervise somebody who is like my dad? They look like my dad to me. Well, if you're supervising by bossing them around, it's probably going to be difficult. But if you're supervising by bossing around, it's not going to work well anyway. So the way you should be supervising people is by engaging what they're good at. And you're in charge, but that doesn't mean you should be telling them how to do their job. If you're telling somebody how to do their job, they probably shouldn't be in that job. They're supposed to know how to do it themselves, right? So it requires a different way to supervise in order to make this happen. Well, absolutely. Skills have to improve in an organization. If you look at Europe, for example, we have very high youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. We have a, a fat middle where you have a largely, between the age of 25 to mm -hmm. 45, you have a, a good chunk of employed. Yeah. And then the unemployment spreads out again. Yeah. And if we, only, if we move the retirement age upwards, that's going to become a bigger problem than the youth unemployment. Now, can the free market adapt to this? Can yeah. we? Can our working skills, will they adapt naturally? Yeah. Or is there a role for government here to legislate or, or, yeah. or kind of incentivize uh, yeah. changing our behaviors? Well, just to, this is the irony of the conversation, right? On the one hand, we hear in Europe, in all the developed economies mm. except for the US, we're seeing the age uh, of the population grow older. And the reason is because we're living longer, which is a great thing, right? I mean, who yeah. would want the opposite? We could solve this problem by having people die young, right? We're living about seven or eight years longer than our parents. And those years of extra life, we can think about as adding to the middle of our life. Because the years of infirmity and disability are actually shrinking in absolute terms. So we're adding healthy years to our life. People need to live longer, to work longer, because they're living longer, they gotta pay for it and they want to keep working, right? So I think at the same time we hear from pundits though that the populations are shrinking in Europe, in the US, every place but the US populations are shrinking. And so where are we gonna find the workers? Well, I, you know, uh, you've got this older population that wants to keep working and there's the answer to your problem, right? I think do we need government intervention Singapore is a nice place to look because Singapore spends a lot of time going around the world figuring out what everybody's doing and trying to capture the best. So they've got some interesting innovations. One of them was uh, the idea that if you were going to be working or want to work past 
the typical retirement age there, the rule in Singapore is that you are freed from all the requirements that you currently have in your job. Pay suddenly up for grabs again. You don't have to keep working at the same wage on the employer side. The job you're doing, that's lifted too. Now you can renegotiate with your employer, the employee, as to what do you want to do next? What's the pay for that going to be? We often assume that people won't want to take a step down, but often they do because they don't want the pressure, they don't want the stress. They've already been vice president, they don't want to do that anymore. Maybe they want to do something that involves more of a social interaction with people, and they're not really expecting to be paid the same amount for it, so don't assume that, right? And the other thing that they've done is interventions to train the older individuals to say, look it, you know, you're going to be a subordinate now, you're not in charge anymore, and to train the supervisors, okay, you have to manage somebody who's older than you are, here's how to think about doing that. So it's kind of guidance and advice, but the key to that is, okay, we're throwing off the old, let's renegotiate about what will work for you and for us going forward. Fair enough. Professor Capelli, I could talk with, uh, with this about you all day, but I know you're highly in demand. So I'm going to stop it there and say thank you very Good. much thank indeed you. for My your pleasure. time. Good. Thank you. Thank you to our audience, and I'm off to buy some anti-wrinkle cream. <laughs>